I hear you doubling. doubling. Really? Mm-hmm. And Facebook's not working. But we're going to roll. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Tunnel Vision. I'm your host, Ryan Abraham, joined by Keely Yor and Shotgun Spratling. We are all practicing social distancing, so we're remote. I'm in studio. Keely is remote at her house. Shotgun's remote at his house. How are you guys doing? Hello. Still just making, making our way through uh, the situation and trying to make the most of it. We are doing that, and uh, hopefully this one works okay. It doesn't, you know, we're, we're trying things out. Doesn't look like Facebook the the stream is working there, so something's changed in their Facebook algorithm. So it is working. Huh? Is it working? working. working. Oh, yeah. yeah, Okay, good. Well, that's good. Well, I thought it wasn't working, so I'm glad it is. Uh, Never mind. Facebook's working, so we don't. uh, (laughs) uh, But yeah, so we have a you know I don't know about to say exciting show. We got a great show for you today. There was uh, Mike Bone, USC's athletic director, wrote a letter to the Trojan family, kind of giving an update what's going on with USC athletics. So we're going to get to that. Quentin Powell, if you remember him, former USC linebacker, tested positive uh, for COVID-19, the coronavirus, and Shotgun got to talk to him a little bit, so we'll kind of get an update. Haven't heard a lot specifically about USC people, so he's kind of the first one, current or former player, so we'll get an update with that. Um, And then also, uh, USC recruiting, it's a dead period, uptick. You're seeing uh, basketball kind of go crazy. Lately, we'll let Shotgun talk about that. And then uh, USC did pick up a running back commitment uh, for football as well. So things are looking up. You can see the new coaches, and this one specifically, Mike Jenks, doing out there, going, doing work. They're really uh, pounding the pavement during this dead period, which you can still text uh, and, you know, get a hold of recruits. That way you can't have any visits anymore. But they're doing doing a good job with that. We'll see. Uh, you know, a guy like that coming, you know, committing from Texas, another highly ranked, you know, high ranked player. So the class of 2020 already looking much, much better than the class. Uh, I'm sorry, 2021 looking a lot better than the class of 2020. All right. Well, we've got a lot to talk about. First of all, how are you guys doing? You guys all right? I hate, I hate to, to, to be the bearer of bad, bad news, but apparently there's, there's a, a major, major echo. echo. Major echo for you guys. Yes. yes. The, the echoes, echoes are. are Coming, coming in, in to do the, the comments. comments. So, mm, okay, let me see what I can do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how about that? Is that better? I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they do. We'll see what they say. Uh, yeah, I think that we're just continuing to, to do what uh, we've been asked to do by the the officials above us to stay home and shelter in place and do all those things. So, uh, you know, it just continues day by day working and uh, trying to figure out uh, those type of things. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So I got to, I got some feedback on this from last time and that we, I did what they said to try to do it. What are the comments saying now? Is the echo still there? Or? Still, still echo. echo. I, believe I believe it's, it's for me and shotgun. shotgun. Yeah. yeah it's, it's me right. and shotgun. Right. It's the remote have. thing. Okay. Uh, it is a little Give me one second. Uh, okay. 
Sorry. You're yeah. the one that has good audio, so. I know, I'm the one that has good audio, but I need to like look at what I can fix, you know. Uh, I feel like. Let's make a quick, quick correction. Uh, Quentin Powell actually has not tested positive for COVID-19. He's, he was hospitalized uh, and then is now self-quarantining after having symptoms. Tony Pacelli, however, has been has tested positive for COVID nineteen symptoms. Uh, Mike Freeman from Nick CBS or Bleacher Report now um, uh, put that out earlier today. So you know that's a you know a much bigger name than Quentin Powell. Obviously a Trojan great Tony Maselli, but unfortunately, yeah, he has tested positive. He was actually in the ICU for a little bit. So scary situation there. But it looks like he's doing a little bit better now. All right, I tried to mute you guys on that. So let's see. In the comments, uh, apparently my echo is worse than shotguns. Not sure how. If you have <laughs> settings, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So the, oh, we're getting echo over here. So Ryan sounds good. Echo. Um, so yeah, just tried to mute them, both of you, on the different. So there's because they're remote. That's why we're having these problems. We don't have these problems when they're in studio. Uh, so sorry about that. This might be a little bit slower going show to get it going, but we'll get it going. Is, is it better now? You guys talk a little bit. Hello. Apparently, it sounded better. Not sure. Um, but Jonathan, you were Johnny on the spot. You you wrote that story about Quentin Powell. Um, what did he have to say when you talked to him? Uh, yeah, I, was, I just was able to message him a little bit and just kind of get what was his uh, what was his message to people. And you know, he was just trying to say, "Hey, everyone needs to take this serious and, and treat it um, with kind of the respect the situation deserves, and you know, not to to play around or anything because." of how important it is because he's been away from his family. You know, he has a, a young daughter and, you know, has basically been in a hotel room for a couple of days and not been able to to see everyone they wants to see and things like that uh, because – and he's in Iowa randomly. I'm not sure why he's there, but um, didn't get into that really. But, you know, just the, his, his comments were basically the hopes everyone is taking it seriously and, you know, they can uh, can see that it can – if it can happen to him, it can kind of happen to anybody. He's a 26-year-old guy, so, you know, and he said it's it's been really tough for him kind of going through the symptoms and stuff. So, you know, hopefully everything works out for him and, you know, he gets better and can can heal up from it. And like I said, with Tony Baselli getting it, you know, he was in ICU, so he's actually, you know, moving wow. forward and um, is, is progressing in his recovery from it. So hopefully he gets back healthy as well. Obviously a, a USC legend there. Uh, uh, you know, one of the top draft pairs, and you know, kind of their centerpiece of their team for a, a few years. He and Mark Brunel um, during during his career. So you feel for those guys, and I think it just kind of makes it hit home a little bit more. I mean, some people have had, you know, you know someone, or knows, you know, you've seen someone, uh, or you've seen a, a familiar name that has has got it. But I think uh, for the USC family, I think it hits home a little bit when you see a recent player. You know, Quentin Powell graduated in 2017. Um, and, you know, his last game was the Rose Bowl game. Uh, you know, he had a big impact in that one. Uh, the defense kind of turned around when he, you know, when he took, o took over for Cam Smith, when he got ejected, if you remember that game. And Keeley, I know you were on the sidelines and seeing him, you know, kind of rallying the troops in that game. So, yeah, uh, you know, he's a, uh, a young guy that gets it. And then Tony Baselli, obviously a big-name guy from USC to get it. He's not that old either, so – I think it just kind of hits home a little bit more for USC fans to, when they see those those guys uh, are, are ones that have uh, had, had symptoms in and have, have tested positive for it. Yeah, you would think over the next you know week or two, there's going to be more names that you're familiar with, either in your own circle or yeah. people, teams that you follow, things like that. Uh, you know, like James Dolan, like the owner of the you know, the, the, Knicks, the yeah. Knicks get like there's you're, it's kind of random like this random like oh that person's got it or you know Jim Edmonds you know he's you know someone you know, former Angel uh, Keeley familiar with that um, yeah so th let everyone know because we we had a little so it looks like the echoes are gone which is great uh, there's yes. different camera angles I might have to fix them for each one so if there's a quick echo I will try to I, I know what to do now I can fix it uh, we will be taking phone calls so you can call five one two four tunnel if you want to do some live phone calls so we'll hopefully that'll work. I think it will. Uh, you can also tweet us, uh, hashtag Tunnel Vision, hashtag Tunnel Vision. Don't put a whole bunch of people's names in it. Don't put a whole bunch of stuff in front. Just tweet with hashtag Tunnel Vision. The smaller, the better. It'll be easier to show up on the screen. Uh, we'll put that up. So, um, yeah, we're looking forward to uh, kind of you know getting some of your comments. I will pull up the – I didn't pull it up before, but I'll pull up the YouTube um, – uh, I mean, sorry, for Facebook, we can put the title – we can put the titles up on the screen for – 
Uh, for YouTube, we'll probably just have to kind of read your questions on there. But put questions in Periscope. I'll try to monitor that from here, though, even though I'll be doing a lot of stuff. Uh, <laughs> Facebook and YouTube will try to get to all your questions. And uh, the phone calls are great. We love those, especially. We haven't done those for a couple of weeks. But a long uh, usually, time, yeah, yeah Keely's usually hosting these things, but we'll try that. <laughs> Um, well, you're, doing, me, you're doing great, Ryan. Thanks. Well, I'm going to switch to this camera angle and then see. Uh, I think, yeah, let me fix that real quick. Okay. So you guys should be okay. You can talk now. Um, so we have, this is our like three person uh, screen. This is different. So we're, we're, we usually are all in the studio and, you know, there's technical problems when you're trying to broadcast on the three platforms live anyway. Uh, but for something like this, this is like, you know, we haven't really done these kind of things before. Like try to bring in one person, but. To do it all remotely, we'll try to keep these going. I think these are fun shows to do. We'll kind of keep, uh, you know, talking with all the fans. And, uh, you know, they, they, we get a lot of positive feedback that they like having something as a distraction with everything going on. People are kind of going stir crazy in the house. And, um, you know, we'll we'll get it flow. We had to kind of change our uh, workflow a little bit. But I think we got it working a little bit better uh, now. So uh, the, let's go maybe to the Mike Bone uh, letter, guys. So it was... <laughs> Uh, when we heard on Trojans Live, I guess it was last Monday. Um, it was this past believe. Monday. I believe. Uh, it's so blur, blur, to be honest. Days don't I think really. It was Monday, Monday, I guess. Days mean nothing. It was a really kind of information packed Trojan Live. I mean, you had mm -hmm. Andy Enfield, you had Clay Helton, you had Mike Bone, you had Aaron Osmus. Um, hopefully, you guys got to check out the the three part series I did with Aaron Osmus talking about the what they're doing in the off season. And actually he gave you some advice for what you could do at home. If you're do working out, you don't really have a home gym, but Mike bones, I thought was probably the most informative. And just the fact that he has a daily conference call with all the athletic directors and Larry Scott, they're definitely on top of this, trying to figure what's going on. I, everyone knows if there's no, and there, I don't think anyone's ready to talk about the potential for no football season. I know Kirk, Her Kirk Herb street, did a little bit, but it would be devastating to a lot of the athletic departments. We talked about that before, but it was a pretty thorough letter he sent out to the Trojan family about what was going on. Maybe Shotgun, get your thoughts first, and then we'll go with, with Keeley after that. I mean, Keeley wrote about the what he wrote, so I'll let her go first, and then I'll, uh, okay. I'll comment off of what she has to say. Hey, you know, I'm the host. When I say you go first, you go first. No, go ahead, Keely. <laughs> Apparently, Apparently, why, 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 I go back, back to, to uh, unfortunate, unfortunate news, news, I believe. I believe. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, but I've become, become essentially the, the Mike, Mike Bone Bone reporter, reporter since, since quarantine, quarantine started. started. I wrote, I wrote on his Monday uh, Trojans Live and then his letter on Friday. Basically, his letter on Friday, he built on what he said on Monday, uh, which was just that they're kind of in their new normal right now. If you remember, USC actually had its spring break uh, last week. So this was the first week back from uh, spring break where they were working in their new normal, uh, working remotely. Uh, he kind of built on what he had already talked about in Trojans Live. Uh, he's having the 8.30 conference call with all the other Pac-12 ADs, as well as Commissioner Scott and other league officials. Um, and like we said on the last, uh, I think we actually said this on the podcast, but I think it's just really important that they're doing that. It shows that they are uh, together and working on things well. Uh, and then he was just saying that uh, he's looking over all the student athletes. I think all but seven student athletes have returned home or with friends and family. So they have, they're all in safe spots and are, are being looked out, looked after. Um, and just more ticky tacky things about how they're trying to look forward. I think the most newsier item was that they're still unclear about uh, college sports returning going forward. Uh, he said he just simply doesn't have an answer for whether or not uh, the timing of, of the football season and when student athletes can come back on campus. Um, and they also, because of that, extended uh, the deadline to renew season tickets. I believe I can get those uh, specific dates for you if you give me a second. Um, but let me see, sorry. Yeah, so they renewed the ticket deadline until May 13th. And then if you already have season tickets and you're on a payment, payment plan, uh, they've uh, extended that deadline until July 24th to charge you again. So they're kind of working things around just because there's so many unknowns um, in the college football world, in college athletics. So basically that was the more newsier items. And then he still doesn't know about us another year of eligibility for those spring seniors who got their season cut short. So basically it was building on what he said on Trojans Live. And basically it's not unclear yet on certain things that people are most uh, anticipating to hear from him. Yeah, we kind of have to wait yeah. and see a lot of that. Uh, go, you mm -hmm. go ahead, Shotgun. Yeah, and uh, actually there's going to be, there's a meeting tomorrow. The Division One Council will determine 
Uh, there will be voting on the spring sports and whether or not those players will get be getting that year of eligibility. It seemed like it was kind of a slam dunk that everybody was going to get it back. Uh, last I read, though, that there was some, uh, some sources saying that um, we're telling some other reporters that, you know, it may not be a slam dunk. So, you know, because I think that the, the problem there is you start looking at the financials of it and, you know, roster sizes and different things that I've talked about a little bit in the past. But I think those things are going to have to be discussed now. Is it going to give everyone a, a, a year back, and how will that happen? And, I mean, there's just a lot of things that are still up in the air. The MLB uh, draft was being looked at as potentially being canceled, but now they're they're looking at going with a shorter draft, potentially a five or ten round draft. So you're going to lose the top juniors from from teams. You know, you're going to lose the the Spencer Torkelsons at at uh, Arizona State and those really big name guys. But how many people are going to be gone? How many people are still going to be left? How many of those freshmen that may have signed, if it was a you know a, still a forty year uh, forty round draft, um, the incoming freshmen from high school, how many of those guys are actually going to end up at D one schools? You know you, you don't know. So I think in baseball in particular, there's going to be a lot of you know there's going to be some roster issues that have to be figured out. I think they're going to have to discuss that uh, tomorrow in that meeting. But then there's also the other sports that you know it's going to have similar things where you know if you give senior you know you have a senior heavy class. Well, you know, if you had four seniors on your team for a smaller uh, roster size sport and you have four freshmen that are coming in to kind of fill those spots, are you going to cut some people, you know, or are you going to, you know, you're going to make the rosters bigger? You know, how are you going to kind of deal with that? Yeah. I mean, let's just say just because I know the basketball roster really well, if you gave all those seniors a year back and now you have five seniors that come back, well, are you now telling the guys that are in coming freshman, we, we don't have room for you unless the NCAA is going to agree to bump up the scholarship limit for one year or for two years and kind of change things uh, that way. So I think there's a lot of things that have to be discussed in that meeting tomorrow, and it's going to be a very important one for the future of some of these players, especially the seniors that in the spring sports, uh, because they're going to decide whether or not to actually give that year of eligibility back. Yeah, I think for the – it sounds like for the spring sports, there's a much better opportunity because they're just getting started where – you know, if it's you're talking about basketball, you only miss the postseason. They're probably not going to yeah, give not, you that back. You know, yeah, I'm not saying that they're going to get basketball. I don't think that's going to be it's going to happen. I was just using that as an example, just because I know that roster a little bit better. But spring is still up in the air. You know, what once everyone thought was okay, yeah, this is definitely going to happen. Now it's you know now there's some uh, you know some ebbs and flows to this discussion on whether or not it's going to be work out and whether the financials and everything are going to work out for the schools because. You know, you're, you're putting a lot of money, extra money uh, on some of those schools, and not every school is a USC or an Alabama. You know, so you, when you're going and you're looking at a Wichita State or, you know, whoever else that's in a mid-major in Division One, you know, are they going to be able to afford? Is Radford going to be able to afford, you know, adding an extra, you know, four or five players on scholarship type of thing? Uh, th those those are the issues that uh, they're going to be discussing tomorrow in that Division One council meeting. Radford, that's a, that's a pull out of there. Um, we did have a Facebook question from Jeff. Uh, can kids yeah. do PRPs without supervision, or is that not allowed? Position groups, uh, too, to keep it under 10 people. Um, I mean, as of right now, you can't do it. They're, they're like, like uh, I think Keeley said, there's only, what, six student athletes that are still on campus or something? Or seven, I believe, yeah. Yeah, there's not very many. So uh, I think you could probably have, like, if Keaton Slovis was near – Tyler Vaughn's and they wanted to go throw the football around, but there's not going to be anything uh, that's organized. I mean, talking to Aaron Osmus, who they, you know, they get a lot of time with, with these, with these athletes, they're, you know, FaceTiming with them. They're doing Instagram stuff with them, whatever they're doing to try to help out all these guys and do their own personal workouts. But as far as like working out as a team or doing any kind of, you know, PRP, PRP practices, there's not, I, I can't envision anything official happening anytime soon. I don't know. What do you guys think? No, definitely. I, I think that, you know, it, it's hurting a lot of players. I mean, even like high school kids that want to work out with each other, they're still able to do some things, even though, you know, you, you got the shelter at home uh, orders in effect. You still Players are still getting out there and throwing and whatnot. But I was talking with one high school player. and He said, hey, you're bringing wipes, you're bringing hand sanitizer out with you to the, the practice field. And those things are a little bit different, but they're still – you know, if you're just throwing the football around, you're running routes or something, you got a quarterback throwing, you can still do those things as long as you're, you know, taking care of the, 
to wipe down the football over and over or whatever it may take there. So if you're taking those extra precautions, they can still do a little bit. However, you're not, I don't think you're going to see the fully organized things like you would in a PRP. You're not going to have the coaches giving them a game plan like, okay, run these routes, do these type things. I think that's kind of on people on their own. And a lot of people are still, a lot of players are still training on their own and doing different things in parks and, you know, at the, in their garage or wherever they have a little bit of room. Uh, but I don't think you're going to see, you know, a, a group of people going, uh, getting together and doing it. And they probably shouldn't be doing that because, you know, once you get four or five guys, then, hey, are you stretching right beside each other? Are you keeping your distance? And do you have a big enough area in the park? Is there other yeah. people in the park? I think there's a lot of question marks that then start coming up if you have that. So I think that you're seeing a little bit of people doing things on their own, but I don't think you'll see the organized stuff. The uh, the surface stuff is a big concern. And Shotgun, you talked about that. If you're throwing the football, like Keely, if you and I are throwing a football, whatever's on my hands is going to get on your hands. You can't like clean the ball while it's in the air. Like b- between me and you, like I'm touching Just, the like, ball. Like disinfect it before it comes into my hands with yeah. the spray. Yeah, like there would be like this mister kind of thing going around yeah. and you like throw it through that. Um, I mean, they, so I live in Hermosa Beach. They shut down the volleyball courts. Even if you're just peppering, you know, bumping the ball back and forth with somebody, you're still, yeah. so I think that's probably part of the concern. I mean, are you, I, I don't think they would allow anything like that to happen. It would, it would have to be like, Keaton and, and Tyler Vons are thrown on their own and, and people don't really know about it. But it, uh, having a group, it just doesn't seem possible. Yeah, especially this and, early and those in the qu- quarantine. Yeah, go ahead, Keely. Yeah, just, just this early in the quarantine when we don't fully know things and testing is still not widely available. Maybe if we get further down the road and, and players are have easy access to tests and, and maybe Keaton and Almond Ross St. Brown know, hey, I'm good or I had it and now I'm good we can throw maybe you'll start to see things slowly come together but right now with like all the directives from state and local and federal stuff i don't think you'll see groups of people i think you definitely have to wait and yeah. see for sure wait, i'm sorry shaka what was your thought on that uh the thing is you know with surface contacts and it, it's all about not touching your face so you know if the guys have gloves on and you're you know you're wiping down the gloves and whatnot uh, as long as people aren't touching your face and you shouldn't be uh, getting it because from the football, at least, you know. Uh, so that's the thing. If you're getting that surface contact, uh, I think the bigger issue is, you know, if you, you know, you're you're out throwing with your buddy, usually you're going to want over, you know, you're used to going over and high-fiving and hugging and all the other things that you normally do. It's just making sure that you're keeping yeah. that distance and not doing any of those type things. Um, but I, I think that as long as you're wiping down the football kind of, uh, you know, on a routine basis, I don't think that that's a you know going to be a huge deal because I, I would say if it's two people, let's just say it's two people, both of you wash your hands, you wipe down your gloves, you wipe the, down everything before you start, and you throw the football around, you've wiped down the football, not a great chance of, uh, of it, it getting to the other person that way as long as you're not, again, touching your face. I think that's the biggest thing is, is avoiding all – contact with any uh, uh, of your skin surfaces when you can and making sure that you're as soon as you're done you're washing your hands and stuff too so it can be done are we recommending it be done no, uh, no. You know, it's probably, probably safer not to even try to attempt any of those things and that's why and that's that's giving a two-person situation once you add yeah. a third and fourth and fifth and sixth yeah. person it just becomes that much more difficult to try to you know keep the distance but also to, to make sure someone, you know, doesn't perspire onto the football or whatever it may be. And then, again, yeah. just everyone keeping their hands away from their face and things like that. It just becomes that much more difficult. And, you know, when you're out doing work and trying to put in work to, to get better, it's not the first thing that's coming to your mind is, okay, make sure I don't, you know, brush my face, you know, if something, you know, if I feel a fly land on me or something, you know, when you accidentally do that and then suddenly, you know, there becomes an issue. So, I think it's just much safer for all the players to be doing things on their own as much as they can. And, you know, maybe someone needs to invest in the jugs machine to have it in the backyard or whatever. But, you know, you do what you can, make make up uh, things you go, you lift a TV, you pull a car, whatever it takes. Uh, uh, but I think it's that's mostly. Uh, it's pushing a car. Yeah. Yeah, that's what. So, yeah, so that's what Aaron Osmus told me. So it was funny. Because we know we've had him on and he's all strength training, not really working out. And a lot of people right now, if you're doing a home workout, maybe you have some dumbbells or you have a stair, a step or something. But 
most people you're trying to do like body weight stuff because that's what you have. You might have like a mat in your garage or whatever. And Osmus was just like not about it. You know, he was like, eh, that's not really what I'm into. Like he, and he said, yeah, I'd rather see you do maybe some push ups. He didn't even seem to like push ups for some reason, but the pull ups, he wanted you to do pull ups, like go to a monkey bars or something, which that now you're talking about a surface. They like the ones in Hermosa, yeah. they've actually put tape around. So you can't do that. He said, grab yeah. a tree branch. He said, well, you know, just have your, your mom, like someone in your family get in the car and put it in neutral and steer and you push it, you know? And it's like, okay. So I guess that was, he'd rather be doing stuff like that. Like figure it out, you know? Um, but the body weight stuff, he was not a huge fan of. Cause that's, I guess that's workouts, not strength training. Yeah. That is more workout <laughs> stuff. Uh, but even I asked him like, okay, so you have like dumbbells. He, he would call them tins. Like you could get tin cans. Like people use bottles of wine. You see people doing like, he goes, but I don't want them to do a hundred curls. But, you know, some of those workouts you do, that's like, hey, you're doing something for a minute. Maybe it's light weights, but for a minute. And he's not, he's like, I think he would say like, yeah, I need to get better at that stuff. But that's not been, he'd rather you do three of them as much as you can. Three reps of just as much weight as possible than 50 weights. Yeah, than 50 times of, of a, a lighter weight, which you get your heart rate up and it's still a good, you know, workout. But maybe it's not the strength <laughs> training that he's... uh that he enjoys, so he, yeah. Sure. This is not. This is sort of a nightmare for him because he wants everyone lifting heavy and eating thick. You know, or, yeah, right. Did I get that right? Yes. Yes. I, I think so. Up? Yeah. So now you're like lifting whatever and rationing, eating yeah. rationally. Yeah. I lift, guess <laughs> lifting <laughs> light, new, but a lot. You know. Yeah. That's not really being his creative. Thing. It's um, a new. Yeah. Thing. One of the common things, and we had a question from uh, Ryan. Do you believe the college season will be canceled? And we kind of mentioned this earlier, uh, you know, something that Kirk Herbstreet talked about. I mean, I, I think that everyone I've talked to, it's like they don't even want to fathom that, that that could be a possibility. But obviously, uh, you know, it could be. And, you know, you talk about, okay, having two guys throw, maybe you could do it. Well, if you're worried about, 10 guys or, or 15 guys, you know, every, every player you add, it adds to a level of complexity because there's a hundred guys on the team. This is a huge group of people that are going to be together. So for yeah. football, it's got to get there. I was talking to our former uh, colleague of my, you know, my, my friend, Dan Wykey, who covers the NBA for the Los Angeles Times. He used to write for us and covering USC football. And one of the, and I hadn't heard this, that I probably just missed it. I don't know if you guys did, but one of the things that would be kicked around is, you know, it's a smaller team. Like you could have everyone in the NBA tested and sort of like quarantined and then play each other. But he yeah. said you could have everyone come out to like Vegas, for example. So like all the teams are there and they're playing like for television audiences in Vegas. So it's it's like you're not even like flying around to different cities. Like you're just like Vegas is going to be the hub of the NBA. Everyone's tested. And you're in this like bubble basically. And then everyone could kind of play each other. You could, I mean, you can't yeah. obviously do that in college football, but the NBA, yeah. maybe like college football is not ready, but the NBA would be. Um, but I, just ha the sheer number of people in college football yeah. means everything's got to be like, you know, everyone's got to be back to normal almost. Yeah. And I think we talked about this last week is like, it makes more sense when you talk about the NBA because they're professionals. They're waiting around to do their job. Whereas student athletes, they're students and the universities are the ones who look after their overall health and well-being. And that's why I think if college football this 2020 season were to happen, that means that we've definitely um, made significant strides. We've had that time between uh, the peak so that things can kind of become no more normal again. Maybe a, a vaccine is created, but I think in order for this season to happen, we have to make sure we're clearly out of the woods with the coronavirus because otherwise I just don't see with all the variables with how many people are involved with college football how much traveling is is involved I just don't know how it's feasible and I don't think universities might maybe not athletic directors but universities at the top will be willing to risk uh, or bring on the risk that comes with having a season like this yeah what do you think shotgun yeah I think just so many people are, are a part of a football game you know there's so many players there's so many uh, you know, efficient, efficient, and, you know, there's so many just so many crucial people versus it's 10 people on the court and three officials. You know, you can have 13 people if you just have the two coaches. Maybe you have, you know, you have the rest of the teams back away from the, the court a, a good ways, and that's 15 people. 
football, you got you got more than that on each uh, every single you know, with with 22 players on the field, and I think it's eight officials. So you know, it's a, it's a much different environment, and just like you said, you know, when you have to add in the schooling and different things, you're not going to have a you know, you're not going to be able to bring everybody together for one area of, uh, you know, one area of the country to play your games and things. So it's going to take a lot uh, of time and effort here. And I, I, for me, the biggest thing is the testing. Once the testing is, and there's there's been some nice developments there, but once the testing is readily available to everyone and you can do tests quicker, then I think that's when you find out your true number of cases, you know, and, and figure out you can start tracking where people have been to try to, try to eliminate as much as possible the contact and quarantine people as needed. Um, so I think it all starts with the testing. And, you know, I think that maybe we're kind of in the halfway point. You know, South Korea had their first case the same day as the U.S. That was almost exactly two months ago. And they're basically uh, have uh, you know, kind of knocked things out there and are trying to get back, starting to get back to normal a little bit. So that was two months. So if the U.S. can get on the same track, you know, maybe in two months that we can start seeing things start to get back to normal uh, with the way South Korea has been able to do. But like I said, I think it starts, for me, it starts with testing and being able to get people um, to know whether or not they have it, whether they have had it. You yeah. know, there's two kind of two separate yeah. tests. Um, like the antibody test. Yeah. Reading it. yeah. If yeah. There's, like if you, yes, there's exactly. an antibody so, test that's easier because all three of us might have had it. Well, Keely not because, you know, she'll be get. When Keely I, gets sick, I was really sick in February. That's I true. I don't know. I think I might have had it. Not sure. But I was really yeah. sick in January. But you know who knows? Like that. But if you've yeah. had it already, then you know. You know, it, it's it's that's good information too. We just don't know. There's, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that had it and didn't even know. Yeah. My uh, question and, is. Go ahead. Keely. Sorry. My question. I know you guys don't have the answers, but say hypothetically, God forbid, the twenty twenty football season gets canceled. What does that mean for guys? I know, I know. It's I don't even want to go there. I go there sometimes, and it gets me sad. But uh, there's obviously bigger problems in the world. But right. um, what happens to guys that are six years, fifty years, like a Daniel Marbebe? Like, what happens to them? Do they come back for a whole nother year? Like, what are the logistics with this? I think it all comes back to, you know, the what the NCAA decides, for one, obviously, but also, you know, the financials of it. You know, it, our, our football team, our football program is going to be like, you know what, we just need to, you guys got to go. You know, it's basically, it's time for you guys. We're sorry you missed your senior year, your final year, but you know, we need to get other players in. And, you know, life's not fair at all times. We can't afford to pay 130 players you know, for an extra year of, of tuition and everything else. So, and the housing and the food and everything else. So, because one of the things is going to be financial, definitely. If USC or if uh, if college football does not happen next year, it's going to be a huge financial burden on the, the athletic programs and especially in other areas. So, you're going to have cutbacks everywhere. You're going to, you may even lose some sports in some schools yeah. because of football, you know, football pays for a lot of other uh, sports. So if that happens, it's not just going to be like, well, football gets to keep going because they make money. No, if you're cutting another sport, you're going to be making cutbacks at, on the football program as well. Um, so it's going to be, it's again, it's a wait and see thing, but uh, financials will play a big part of it. I think for for those type of guys like a Daniel Morabebe, it might just be, uh, you know, kind of a, sorry that this happened, but it's time for you to go. It's, you know, it's time for you to just start your, your career as a, you know, in, in, in a sport other than football. Yeah, and I put Sean's question up there. Um, he said, if the season is not played, good for USC, right? Sports are the SEC's main source of income. Meanwhile, schools with big endowments like USC, it really doesn't hurt them as much, in my opinion. And I, the endowment for USC is different than the athletic department budget. I mean, there's, it would hurt all the schools. And, and you know, school like USC, everyone. I mean, you, all like Shotgun said, you could potentially lose sports because – you know, basketball might pay for itself. Uh, some schools, it, it'll pay for more than that, but most it's, you know, it's a break even kind of thing and football pays for everything else. So what, you know, everything else wouldn't get the same kind of, uh, you know, money that they normally would get. So I think it's bad. It's, it's bad for everyone. I don't think USC would be fine because they have a big endowment or Stanford or whatever. I, I still think as the athletic departments go, uh, there's going to be some, some major hurting going on. And also, you got to factor in, you know, donations. If there's 
There's no, I think a lot of schools lose big donations to their athletic departments too. And how much are other, you know, the people that are normal, they losing it or just hected. You know, I, I think that college athletics could take a really big hit. And maybe, maybe you see some cutbacks of just, hey, instead of having, you know, a life coach for Clemson and, you know, my dream job over there, uh, instead of having those type things and, you know, having 30 extra support staff members, maybe you start cutting back a little bit and then, hey, we'll work our way back up to, you know, where they are in some of those, you know, the, the support staff race and everything else that there has been the last five, ten years. You know, maybe you start cutting back on those type things. Hey, we don't need seven different uniforms every year, whatever it is. You know, maybe you start seeing some cutbacks and then, you know, there's a dip and, you know, college football and all of college athletics starts to work its way back out of that dip um, after uh, things get back to normal here. Yeah, maybe. And then the, the issue, Keely, like what you were talking about with, hey, what do you do you give Daniel and Bebe another year and all the seniors yeah. another year if they want it? Well, that's money also. I mean, that's also, you know, you're paying money to do that. So your your yeah. athletic department's going to take a major hit. And but then if you're going to try to make it right for the student athletes, which would mean allowing all the seniors to come back. So you got to pay for their scholarships. You're going to have to expand the roster. So if you were paying for 85 scholarships, now it might be, you know, 100 scholarships or something because you're still going to have the incoming freshmen coming in. So you have a much bigger team. And that's so you're you would the revenue would go way down because you don't have football. But the expenses would likely go up unless you do things like Shotgun was saying. Uh, what are your thoughts, Keely? Yeah, no, I mean, at that point, I think you have to make the, the best decision for you financially, which I think is what Shotgun's saying is, hey, this was something that was completely out of our control. It affected the entire world. We're sorry, but it's your time. You have to go and we continue the cycle. Because otherwise, it wouldn't make sense financially to keep that extra financial weight on your uh, rosters because you're, you're hurting to begin with, and that will just be an extra burden. Yeah. Right? Let's get get some phone calls in here. 5124-TUNNEL. I want to give a little shout-out to uh, – so Coley, I'll give you – like he sent me a, a little letter. Sent me wow. uh, these these uh, mints, these Irish mint – almond mints were great. He tried to send some chocolate and for – I mean, uh, some chocolate bars and some coffee, and so far they didn't come. But thanks for for Did sending that in. Did it, Ryan? I was sanitized when I came. Yeah, I sanitized it. You know, they're already okay. gone. I, I ate them. Holy Sorry, guys. Do That's fine. I'll no, probably the, won't see you for yeah. a couple months. <laughs> uh, but thanks for that, uh, Coley. Appreciate that. Um, Jeff uh, wrote in on Facebook, uh, Shotgun, Mobley's coming back, right? I don't think he's ready. What's your take? Uh, Isaiah Mobley, I, I believe, will be coming back. I don't think there, there's been no discussion that I've heard that he will be leaving. Obviously, he had a foot injury last summer that kind of – and obviously did not he's not playing up to the level where Nyeka Kongwu is. So he's gonna come back. Why wouldn't he come back? He's gonna get a chance to play with his brother Evan Mobley next year, the number one player in the country. Now, next year you have to look at will you lose both Mobleys because Evan is potentially the number one pick uh going into that next draft after that, the twenty twenty one draft. So I think that's when you you wonder if Isaiah but, uh, you know, there was there was always a thought, even if he would have had the same season that uh, Anyeko Kongu had, say, well, maybe he come back because his brother's coming in and get a chance to play with him one last time. You know, would that draw be there with their dad on staff and everything? I think with the way he performed this year and just, you know, not that he was terrible or anything, just not living up to the five-star hype, you know, as a freshman, I think he'll have a much bigger role next year, um, you know, going forward and playing alongside his brother next year. Then I, I think that they – then he's going to come back for sure. You know, the roster is going to be much different, though, and they need him to come in and be a, a big-time guy uh, because of how different the roster will be. It'll be second year in a row where they basically just turn over 80% of the roster. They're going to have a, a couple of guys back. Elijah Weaver is going to be back. E Excuse me, Ethan Anderson uh, and Max Agbo Polo are the only other guys, along with Isaiah Mobley, that, that are coming back. So, you know, those four guys are going to have to step up and step forward, and then you add Evan Mobley, you add a couple of grad transfers that they pick up this week. And you move forward and keep trying. And they're they're still in the market and still trying to recruit Zaire Williams, who's you know probably the the top uncommitted player that's out there, the most highly sought after guy right now. Uh, you have him and Jalen Green, who's in Northern California, who may turn pro. Still question marks there whether he's going to college. Um, but Zaire Williams, 
big name guy, number five or number six overall prospect in, in the in the country, and you know USC still in the mix with him. That's funny. So uh, me doing the hosting stuff, you get to control the different camera angles and stuff, and then. So when like shotgun's talking, I'll put it on just shotgun, but I can still see what everyone's doing. So like if Keely goes to get a drink or something while you know she's not on camera, then I like I want to try to flip it over real quick so we catch her doing that. So just to, wow. Just to be, no, we don't do that. But um, yeah. So I'm not used to. So if you normally watch our show, Keely's normally sitting in this spot, and and shotgun and I are over there, and we're on a. So I'll I'll show that now. This is where Shotgun and I would be sitting, but we're obviously not there. There's nobody there. We still got the camera on. You can see this is like our whole studio setup. Hi. Uh, but, you know, there's no one else there because we got to do the social distancing stuff. So normally this is what Keely does. So I really appreciate You haven't done it for a while. You appreciate that there's all these screens Thank and everything you. going on of, of uh, what's cra It's kind of crazy. We got a, a another basketball thing. God, uh, Julie wrote in Shotgun. Do you have a percentage breakdown of the class in basketball? For example, 50% of NCAA players are freshmen or 25 are sophomores, 15 are juniors, 10 seniors. I would think the breakdown would make a difference in how the story moves forward. And if I were a coach, I'd probably excuse the seniors for a high-profile freshman. What do you think? Um, I, don't, I don't know exactly. Uh, I'm trying to look at the question on my phone because my – my computer froze up as far as my YouTube. So oh, I, I don't exactly understand what you're looking for there, Julie. Uh, I, if you're looking at what just the overall breakdown is of student athletes that are playing college basketball, you know, I think it's probably still pretty even. Uh, you don't have a ton of one and done kids. They're most, they're the high, high profile guys. So you hear about them more, but you still have a ton of seniors and stuff. And you have a ton of seniors that move their final year. You get the graduate transfer. And it's become a big part of college basketball and who can get the best grad transfers and how they can kind of boost their teams and stuff. So I don't think that teams are necessarily pushing people out uh, as seniors to bring in a freshman. You know, that's something you do every single year, though. It's it's roster management. You have to be looking at, you know, not just the next year, but also two years in advance. You know, USC picked up a couple of 2021 uh, commits this week as well for basketball. and But you're looking in the future for that because – you do have, you know, this year at USC, as of right now, they have two commits in, the, in their incoming freshmen. They lost five seniors. So, obviously, there's going to be roster spots that are available. Now, you add Noah Bowman, who was a transfer last year. Uh, you add him to the active roster now. Uh, you know, he does the scholarship, so he's not uh, – your numbers don't change there. But that's why you're now going after. You see, okay, those guys left. Anyeka Kong was gone. Okay, now we're going after a couple more grad transfers than maybe we anticipated because we didn't know if, if somebody was going to leave early. We didn't know if there's going to be a transfer like Kyle Sturdivant. Obviously, Kyle Sturdivant would probably still be at USC if it wasn't for the unfortunate um, uh, death of his father. Uh, he's going to be transferring probably closer back to home after this. You know, he loves USC. Uh, chatted a little bit with him. You know, at, towards the end of the season, I've messaged with him since and. Now, it's just a, a bad situation, but he would still be on roster. So that's probably one you're not looking at going forward. Uh, but so maybe now you go, okay, well, we got an extra roster spot. Let's see if we can fill it with either, you know, is there another fresh uh, coming friend out there we really like and we can try to get in on, you know, recruiting late. Usually not the case. Usually you go and try to get another extra grad transfer. So a lot of times you're bringing in those late seniors more so than you're kind of kicking out seniors uh, to bring in a, a true freshman. Yeah. Um we, we, you, I, yeah, go ahead. Jump in. I was just going to jump in with some YouTube questions because uh, people want to know from Shotgun. Uh, Trick Ranger said, how did SC go from not getting great basketball talent to getting number one draft picks? Well, obviously, they've, they've kind of closed off the border. It helps that UCLA has not been great over the last five years. You know, the one year with Alonzo Ball, but I, I think that really has helped them. Because there's always a ton of talent in Southern California, but a lot of times it is, you know, it's gone elsewhere because USC has not been the big destination. Now, Tim Floyd, while he was at USC, was able to keep some of the talent. He was able to bring some talent in. You know, the, the one thing that I've heard a lot from high school coaches is that the USC coaching staff is constantly in contact with them. You know, it's not – they're not hot and cold on players. Uh, you know, I was talking with, with a coach earlier this week uh, about one of the commits they got. He said, you know, it wasn't, hey, he had a good game and – the co coaches are suddenly calling him. He had a bad game. Eh, they don't really. They're not reaching out as much. They're constantly in contact, and I think that 
they've emphasized recruiting and how important it is. And they brought in some big name talent. And obviously they're bringing in the number one player in the country because Eric Mobley is on staff. You know, that's been a long tradition in college sports is if you hire someone as the coach, you know, and he has really good sons, that usually helps you with your recruiting efforts of that really, those really good sons. That's nothing new. It's nothing illegal. It's, it's not like Eric Mobley came in to be a secretary or they made up some wishy-washy job for him. He's on the staff as an assistant coach. You know, he has a really good had a really good reputation uh, as co from coaching the Compton Magic. He's come in. He's been, you know, the third assistant. So there's not a ton put on his plate, but he's kind of learning on the job a little bit as far as just the, the college coaching and a little bit different things that go on there. But he's also coaching up the big men and doing a good job of that as well. So he, and he knows about big men. Obviously, he has a six foot ten son and six foot eleven son. Uh, he knows a little bit about big men. He was a big man himself in college too. So um, I think that that's that's why they're bringing in those guys. But they've been in the mix for guys like Marvin Bagley. They've been in the mix for Zaire Williams. It, you know, they've been in the mix for some of these big name players, and it's because of you know the style of play that they have, and they want to be up tempo when they can if they have the point guard play. And it started with Jordan McLaughlin. Once they got him, they were able to try, try to build on players from there. And at USC, there's a lot to offer, and if you can bring other players that players want to play with, you know, especially in basketball, even more so than any other sport, if there are players that you want to play with, and those connections from AAU and guys that played together and those type things. Those go a long way to help you recruiting. And USC, I mean, people have long thought that USC basketball is a sleeping giant because of the location it's in and the things it has to offer with their academics and, you know, the degree and all those type things that if they got a coach in there that really emphasized recruiting, then they could, could turn things around. And that's what Andy Enfield's done on the recruiting front. All right. Um, we have a caller. So I want to see. Ooh, wow. Yeah. There's no notes in here. So we're just going to we're gonna roll oh. with it. We'll see what. I kind of have a feeling who it might be, so let me uh, let me put them really? on. Yeah, here we go. I'm scared. Caller, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Right. What's your name and where are you calling from, and what do you what would you like to talk about? <laughs> okay. Um, well, hold on. I got to mute you. I got you on too many things here. Okay. So great show, guys. Love you guys. Um, okay. My comment is this. The nation has is on sports withdrawal, kind of like a bad breakup you didn't see coming. And I want to know how you three are handling withdrawal and what what are you choosing to do to keep you from going crazy? That's my question. All right. What's your name and where are you calling from? Um, I'm calling from Laguna Beach, and my name is Catherine. Catherine from Laguna Beach. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, Keely, you want to start with you, or what's the uh, what are you doing well, to not be stir crazy? Shotgun and I both did not hear said caller. I got the very end of it because I switched on to YouTube on my computer. But oh, sorry. You're going to have to paraphrase what the caller said. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so so there, here's another. So we haven't taken live calls while we're doing the remotely, and it's hard mm -hmm. for you guys to hear it. So we'll have to figure out how that works to get you guys to hear the live calls. Uh, she wants to know what, you know, what we're, Catherine wants to know what you're doing to, uh, you know, with, with the lack of sports going on, what are you doing to kind of keep sane? <laughs> Keeping saying I'm not sure if this is uh, happening right now, but I'm trying my best to stay in the day. Um, just getting uh, getting the random things done that I needed to do. Uh, just cleaning my room and working on other stories that I've wanted to work on for a while but haven't had the time to do. I'm not telling you which in case I do them. So <laughs> just, you know, getting to the things on the bottom of the to-do list. How about that? Yeah. What about you, Shotgun? Uh I'm just, this is my normal daily life pretty much. You know, I, I, you know, you work from home most of the time anyway. So it's just, the, it's a little bit different. You kind of get adjusted to not going anywhere at all. So that usually affects how my sleep pattern is like, okay, well, I got to go to this place. So then I actually have to go to bed at, by a certain time. My, my sleep schedule just keeps moving like this forward. You know, the last two days I've gotten up at 6 p.m. Uh, or 5, 5 p.m., 6 p.m., go to bed at, you know, at seven or eight in the morning. Uh, I think I went to bed at nine this morning. Um, so, and it just, it'll, it'll slowly, it'll cycle back to towards the beginning. Uh, you know, that's, that's the way it's going to work. You know, I just, I don't, I don't keep a normal pattern to begin with. So now when I don't have to be anywhere in particular, then it, it, it just means that I don't have to keep the, even a, a semblance of a normal pattern at all. Yeah. You're a vampire basically. You like you yeah, sleep all yeah. day. Um, 
Give Don't me another you... week and I'll be back on a normal schedule, like uh, you know, ninety <laughs> percent of the population. Yeah, uh, I'm trying, like uh, you know, just to stay sane. Um, go, you know, I'll go out for a run. You know, I like to go down to the beach and play some volleyball. I can't do that. I was running on the Strand, which there's there's a bunch of people down there, so you just try to keep your distance. That's closed down. There's a little green belt that runs through Hermosa. I ran through part of that today. That's probably going to close down. There's a bunch of people on there, so wow. I'll do workouts in my house. I find it even though I'm used to working from home and I can come into the studio, this is like a mile from my house and just, I can be alone in both places or socially distant in both places. The motivation factor for me isn't very high. So I, it's like those stories, like you say, you want to do, like I'll come up with some ideas and you're like, eh, do I really want to do that? I'm like, you know, it's, it's, there's so some of it's tough where it's just like, yeah, I mean, and I'm a very uh, extroverted person. I'm a very social person. So not being out with friends and, and things like that has been, it's been tough, but I'm, I'm trying to watch more stuff on Netflix. Uh, you know, Narcos, uh, season two for, you know, Narcos Mexico came out, obviously, uh, Ozark just, you know, that, that one, you know, uh, came out recently. So I've watched a couple of those trying to do stuff like that. I watched some like poker like that. It doesn't matter. Like I'm not big into rewatching old things, but like you could poker, you can watch like, that's kind of fun to do, but I don't know. It's a, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, but I'll get out there. I, I like went out and chipped some golf balls today, just went to a park and, you know, there wasn't anyone around so you can, you know, it's things you could do. Uh, but I like to at least try to get outside and, uh, and do some yeah. stuff, get some vitamin D. So shotgun sleeps through all the daylight hours. You need a little vitamin D probably. I get out occasionally. I'll get out, go out and go out on, on walks with my roommate and stuff. So, you know, I, I get some sunshine. It's okay. Just depends on if it's while I'm eating breakfast or you know before dinner, right before dinner. Yeah, um, it just depends on the week. Your roommate, that would be your your wife, right? <laughs> or are we not allowed to talk about no, that? No, my roommate. Your roommate. Okay. Um, so we talked a lot of basketball stuff, and there was basketball recruiting, but there was some basketball. I mean, football news too. So, uh, four star uh, running back out of Texas, uh, Brandon Campbell committed we had some stuff on him in the war room kind of heading into it uh either i don't know shotgun or keely either one of you want to kind of make some some comments there because certainly seems like there's some positive uh, momentum uh in the recruiting aspect we've seen more produced videos coming out we're seeing like the whole staff talk about uh mike jenks and everything when uh you know when he gets a commitment yeah. like this so it's it seems like it's a different story right now with recruiting who likes to go? I was I, I keep talking over shotgun, so I was actually going to give him the the uh, floor. I'm deferring, but, go for it. Okay, okay. No, I think like you said, Ryan, the thing that really impressed me was because I have all the coaches on tweet alerts. So when that commitment happened, every coach was not only celebrating the commitment but hyping up Mike Jinx for his work on the recruiting trail. And I thought that was something we haven't seen before where everyone was so involved. Craig Niver, I think I texted Chris Torino. I was like, I need a Craig Niver in my life to hype me up as much as he was hyping up Craig uh, Mike Jinx. So um, that was interesting. I think that just plays to the fact that this recruiting is a team effort now, or at least seems like it is uh, on the recruiting uh, trail for this recruiting staff. And then the thing that uh, was interesting to me is that Campbell was saying that the fact that USC didn't have a running back in its 2020 class was appealing for USC. Um, and so he had offers from Alabama and I believe LSU. Um, so that's something where you see USC kind of take someone out of, out of the picture for that region. Um, so I thought it was an, a, a good pickup for USC, especially now that there's weird dead period. This is a new thing that they're trying to uh, recruit in quarantine. Yeah. So I think this is obviously a positive all around for USC. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I've watched some of uh, uh, Campbell's highlights, and you know, it looks like he's a guy that can catch the ball out of the backfield. Uh, that's one of the areas where they didn't really uh, highlight the running back position as much as I thought that maybe they would uh, last season. So he, maybe he's a guy that is kind of the the prototypical guy they want to use that can catch the ball a little bit more. Maybe they'll start. Uh, advancing what they do with the running backs in that aspect of the game. But I think they going into Texas, you know, they've, they've been running a lot of kids there. To get a four-star running back in a position of need is, is big for them. And to get somebody from Texas that can help them recruit some of those other players that are already in Texas, I think getting that early committed is big for them in that regard uh, because now they can, can use him, they can use Jake Garcia, 
And those guys can kind of combine together and say, hey, well, let's lock down SoCal. Let's lock down these Texas recruits that we're looking for as well. Um, so I, I think it's, it's, it's a big pickup for USC, a four-star recruit, you know, you know, what, how, how many of those were there last year? You know, not many. So the fact that they're, they're off to a good start in this recruiting class is, is a really good uh, news for them. I mean, I, I think they're – I don't remember what the ranking was right now, but just the fact they've gotten some four stars compared to last year's class. And then the basketball class right now for 2021 is number one in the country. So, I mean, there, it was – I called it commit week for, for USC because yeah. uh, they picked up – Basketball, I think, picked a four, four this week, and then uh, football picks up a, a big one uh, to kind of culminate the week for them yesterday. Yeah. Uh, since I got a lot going on, I wanted to look at Periscope real quick. Apologies, because there's you know, when you're producing, it's hard to do all those other stuff. But uh, mm -hmm. they want less basketball. So we, we, I think we're done talking about basketball. That's good. But Michael from South Carolina, he says, opinion on what uh, Helton being retained if the season is canceled. I think this might have come up before you know part of the reason you know when we we've talked about like you know mike bone comes on the job didn't really have a lot of time to kind of assess the job that clay helton has done could you see a scenario where a year passes and then now there's one year less of the guarantee of his contract and all that kind of stuff going on and you have more time to sort of reassess things do you feel like they could make anyone could make a change? I mean, I, I don't know. Would there be any kind of change, not just for Clayton, but anybody? Could you see coaches getting fired after not having any season? That's what I was going to say. Is I think it would all, it, if they wanted to make a move, it would depend on the carousel because if everyone's staying put because of of what happens post coronavirus, I don't think it would be smart because now you're without a head coach and nothing's really moving. So I think, obviously, if you're going to make that move, you have to have something in your back pocket that you're going to replace Helton with. But I just don't know what a post-coronavirus world looks like in sports, especially if the 2020 season is canceled. So it seems like a risky move to do, but we know how uh, unpopular Clay Helton is with the fans, so not sure what you can do there. What do you think, Shotgun? I mean, there, there's obviously a big-name coach out there that, that doesn't have an occupation currently. So... Okay. You know, if they if they could line that up, then maybe you make that move. However, th there is a scenario where it happens, where they make a move. However, if there's not a season, there's no funding coming in, yeah. are you really going to then say, hey, we're going to buy someone, the rest of someone's contract out and go spend a bunch more money on a new coach? No, that's it's, it's just financially would not make any sense there. So I, I, would, I would be very hard-pressed to believe it would happen um, where nothing changes with his status as far as wins or losses or, you know, nothing big happens off the field to cause a controversy or anything. If his status quo and there's not a football season next year and the financial impact that will have, I just don't see how it could happen. Yeah. We got yeah. an interesting question uh, on Facebook from John. For all three of you, what was your first game in the Coliseum? And would you talk about that experience? This is pretty good off-season stuff and we you probably there's probably a bunch of youtube questions too right we can kind of get to but yeah i can run down those two when you want me to um, so my my first one was my freshman year of college back in 1989 that was a long time ago and usc wow. played illinois and jeff george if you remember him was the quarterback so he played the nfl for years big strong arm guy and todd marinovich it was his first start and usc had like a 13 nothing lead and was just kind of just you know beating them pretty badly but they weren't scoring a lot of points, and it was sort of a very conservative game plan. And George comes back and throws two touchdown passes and wins 14 to 13. So that was my first uh, experience um, in the Coliseum. And it was uh, the, people didn't really like uh, Larry Smith at that uh, at that point. But they they ended up winning the Rose Bowl that year. But that was uh, that was the opener against Jeff George and Todd Marinovich. How about you, uh, Keely? And then we'll get Chaka. Oh man. Okay, mine was in 2007. Of uh, my shameful past that some people like to talk about. <laughs> yes. It was after UCLA beat USC uh, 13 to nine in 2006. I like told my parents, I'm like, we gotta go to the Coliseum. Like UCLA is gonna beat USC again, or whatever. And they didn't. USC beat uh, UCLA pretty handily, I believe. And I remember, like, I knew I knew nothing about USC tradition, so I'm like. They're like doing this weird chant and like saying beat the Bruins and it was like so much. And I remember the Coliseum just looked so like tall to me because the Rose Bowl is just like, 
way more flat as far as like the seating goes. So I was just amazed by how many seats there were. And I remember being so sad that we got to the Galen Center after the game ended and I just started crying. I was like, I never want to go back to the Coliseum. And then look where I am. So there you are. Yeah. My family never lets me live it down, but yes. What about you, Shaka? <laughs> I think my first game was USC Virginia in 2010. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, 2009, 2010. I, I'm not really sure. Uh, nothing really stands out as like this is the first game that I've ever been at. I think it was that uh, against Virginia. They won 17 14. I just looked it up uh, with Virginia scoring really late, but it wasn't that close of a game. Matt Barkley, I believe it's freshman year. So, that game, maybe it was the year before. I, I, I would have to actually do research to remember when it was. Nice. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, maybe we should go to. I've some. been to a couple since then, so that, that's why they all kind of flow together and meld. Yeah, uh, there's been a lot of memorable games there, but you know, maybe most of us remember our first, not shotgun, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> Keely, do you want to do some of the uh, YouTube questions? We can't pull them up on the screen, but we can have you uh, kind of read through them. Yeah. It's actually it's the uh, top of the hour, so maybe we should do some rapid, rapid fire. fire, I guess. But I don't know. TBT to rapid fire, yes. Um, Oscar said, is there a chance that Bryce Young will transfer to USC now that the new coaching staff is in place? In place? I'm sure there's no. a chance, I guess. You don't think uh, there's a chance? I don't think that's happening. I mean, I don't think it's happening, there's, but... Not for that chance, reason. I, I mean, there, there's a much better chance of him for something coronavirus-related than because of the coaching staff being in place. Yeah. I see Julie put on Facebook real quick. It wasn't Rodney Pete still the quarterback in 89. Nope. It was Marinovich. Rodney Pete's last year was 88. So I did. I was not in school for Rodney Pete. Hugo says, does Clancy Pendergast currently have a job? Good no. question. I don't think so. He has not been hired by anyone uh, that has made it public at least. Yeah. Yeah. Coley says, has the Pac-12 issued orders for all Pac-12 schools to follow, or do all directives come from the NCAA? We've seen conferences make different rules as far as like the conferences at you know different times said uh, you know spring football was not you know be postponed or things like that. So uh, yeah, I think the conferences still have a, a say in what's going on, but I, I think the probably at this point now it's going to have to be more of an NCAA mandate. Like I don't think the SEC is going to come back and say hey college football's on and not have it come from the NCAA. Yeah. Chuck Ranger says, uh, is Brandon Campbell the new running back commit special or just a good back? Um, I think that's still to be determined. Um, I think the fact that he's a four-star guy and I think the fact that he fits into what they're looking for as far as a guy that can catch the ball out of the backfield, then he could potentially be special in this offense, I think. Um, I, I still would need to see some game film and stuff more – before I make that determination personally. And we do, uh, we did put an analysis piece up there from uh, one of our Texas uh, recruiting analysts. So it's up on the front page of uscfootball.com now. I, I actually haven't got to check it out yet, so I'm going to do that tonight. Uh, but we'll, you know, get some more information on that. But it's a bit, I mean, the coaches are making a big deal out of it. It's definitely just seeing that commit, how different it is with this staff versus the other staff. It's, it's just like night and day. Mm-hmm. Mark Watkins Walken says, once antibody tests become widely available, could we see a contagion-style wristband for everyone who's already had the coronavirus and has recovered, and then they can attend sporting events? I mean, that's an interesting uh, thought. And, yeah. you know, if, if everyone followed rules and stuff, then, hey, that, that might be a good idea. But, you know, what happens when someone just really wants to go to the Super Bowl or someone really wants to go to – you know, USC versus Alabama or whatever game it is, and they try to break the rules and suddenly you have an issue. Yeah, that, that would be tough. I think it would have to be pretty widespread, I would think. But then it, at that point, there's the – if we got to that point, there's that like the herd immunity kind of thing where there's just not that many people that aren't exposed and they're going to be protected by being surrounded by a lot of people that already were. Um, so I – it would have, I mean, that would be like, it have to be like a small percentage, but then you're just let. I don't know. Then it just, it just seems kind of a waste where you're letting like a small percentage of people in. Once it gets to that critical mass where there's a lot of people that are already been exposed, uh, then I don't think it's going to be as important to separate it like that, but who knows what, I guess it's possible. 
Joshua Smith says, hypothetically speaking, if the 2020 season starts as scheduled and USC happens to upset Alabama, where would USC be ranked in the polls heading into the New Mexico game? Wow. Jasper Smith, this is a, a interesting hypothetical that this is a lot of variables that still need to go through. <laughs> yeah. I think our friends at uh, Raina Troy like argued about this and I don't normally agree with Michael, but I completely agreed with Michael. Like Alicia was wow. saying like, uh, USC would be like, I think she said it wasn't even, they wouldn't even be like top 10. And Michael's like, no, they'd be top five right away. And I agree. Like if USC beats Alabama game one, people, they're already going to be ranked. Um, they'll, I think they'll jump into like number five in the country just instantly because you've beat Alabama and they'll probably have looked good doing it. And you're like, oh my God, that guy, Keaton Slovis, who threw for 3,500 yards or whatever last year, like he was amazing. And look at those receivers. Like you, USC would get the benefit of the doubt. So they would have to look good, which they, if you beat Alabama, you're going to look good. The defense would look a lot better and they'd beat Alabama. I think they'd jump up and they're in the top five, like worth like number seven or something. What do you think? Somewhere seven? like seven to 10, probably. Uh, it depends on where they actually start the season and what other teams do, because there's going to be several, if that, that weekend is played as expected or as normal, then there's going to be a lot of really good games. So there could be, you know, five other teams that have really impressive wins too that are ranked above USC, um, you know, going into the the first game. So USC is not going to jump over them as well. I don't, that, Alicia was saying that too. I don't think it matters what anyone else does. Like it's not, that's like the middle of the season. Like you're trying to move up from like 18 to 16 or 15 and that what happens in front of you. This is more about you get reassessed. You are... USC, you're coming, bringing all these plays. You brought 85% of your production back or whatever, and you just went out and beat Alabama and Dallas. So you're reassessed. I don't care, you know, who cares if, uh, you know, Texas or someone at number 10 beat North Texas. Like, that doesn't matter. Like, they don't need to lose. Like, you would just no, jump up there. there's good games going on. There's, there's like Oregon, Oregon, there's Ohio high... State. But like one of them would, you know, like the winner of that game would be, you know, get, you know, stay up there. Like Ohio State wouldn't be dropping down. But USC, I think, would be right up there. You know, five, six, seven, uh, easy from from doing this. There's like five really good games, and USC's not going to jump all those teams if those teams are already in front of them in the rankings. You know, they're not going to jump Oregon or Oregon uh, or Ohio State based on beating Alabama because those beating two Alabama teams is a are going to be big deal. Like, yeah, but if those two teams are already top ten and USC starts at eighteen, then I'll be like, well, you know. Oregon beat them up. Uh, Ohio State, and well, we should we should jump USC over them just because you know they beat Alabama. Well, they just beat Ohio State. Why would you? So I think there's 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 too many quality matches. It was just a weekend where that's the only good game, and you have you know there's they start 18th and one through 17 win their games are all cupcakes. Then yeah, maybe they make a huge jump like that. But I think that there's too many quality games that are going on as well. So like, and then I think it comes down to how they look. Because it's not, yeah, there's a reassessment, but it's not just a reassessment of they got to win. It's a reassessment like, okay, is this team legit? Are they going to win the Pac-12? You know, that's when you, you make that big jump uh, potentially there. I think like Ohio State and Oregon matters, but like if Oregon beats Ohio State at home and USC beats Alabama on the road, I think USC jumps Oregon. Like they just jump them. Michigan, Washington, who cares who wins that game? If USC beats Alabama, they're ahead of both of those teams. Like, So I think those things don't really matter because it's freaking Alabama. You go out and beat Alabama and you have the brand of USC and everyone coming back. Keaton Slovis looks amazing. You're like, yeah, they, they're put them number five, number six. Who cares what Michigan and, and Washington do? It doesn't matter at that point. If both Michigan and Washington are starting above them, then yes, it does. It does. No, like you. You're didn't. gonna say that? <laughs> oh, USC's top ten win is so much more valuable it's Alabama. than their top ten win. Because Alabama so still what? has the brand power, though. They weren't even in the SEC championship. They, I mean, they they've they've been in every oh, playoff like, but one. Like they've missed the playoff <laughs> one time. Like it's freaking Alabama. Like when's the last time they lost a game to start the season? Like they haven't. Like it just doesn't happen. So to me, that trumps not the going rest of them. this year either. They're not <laughs> right. But if they did, USC jumps up there. They jump above Oregon and and all those teams. So, my opinion, we'll see. What do the what do the fans think? Well, Ricky A. Reed wants to know, Ryan. Uh, do you think USC is going to be ranked going to this season with the shellacking they had? Uh, they took against Iowa in the Holiday Bowl. 
Yeah, just because there's a, like yeah. if you look at Bill Connolly's numbers, they bring a ton of production back. Um, you know, there's just there's not a lot of losses there. What eighteen starters or something, and not that always means a lot. But they're going to look at it. You know, yes, they changed the defensive staff, so they'll they'll be ranked probably like eighteen twenty something like that. Is is be my guess. Um. Jason on YouTube said, I didn't realize I was watching The Family Feud. Uh, yes, but I, I got to say, it was really nice arguing about football again. It feels good. It feels like normal life. It does. Very nice. Um, going on to uh, – Dave has an interesting question. He says, do you think the NCAA will mirror whatever the NFL, NFL does in the fall regarding week one kickoff date, spectators, et cetera, or is that comparing apples to oranges? I think it's apples to oranges. I mean, there's similarities, but – in the NFL, you could just do a television only product. Like you could, I think there's more options in the NFL than you have in college because college is just going to be about the environment and all that stuff. So I think TV is such a big deal, <laughs> excuse me, for that, that you could potentially do something different in the NFL. I don't, I don't know. What do you think, Shotgun? I think that there's a chance that there is some here. I, I like your point about how it's just different, you know, with classes and different things like that. There, there's a little bit, you atmosphere is much more important in college football however what's the most important thing to either of those money money and money is what you get paid if you can put on a product even if there's no fans there um so i, I think that if they if the nfl can find a way to do it and the ncaa will try to find a way to do it because of how big of a cash cow uh, ncaa sports is and i think it you you watched with the ncaa followed suit with the nba you know they, they weren't going to make a move they weren't going to make a move Okay, Rudy Gobert, NBA shuts down, NCAA the very next day, they're done. You know, so I think that the NCAA was very much watching other organizations as well. They didn't want to be the ones to make the first move, but they were going to be able to follow. And I think you saw the same thing with, you know, the Olympics and the NBA, and you're going to see the same thing with, like, high school basketball tournaments and stuff. Uh, I think all that is kind of a pecking order, and the NCAA is not on the top of that pecking order. I think they're going to follow a little bit more than lead. Yeah, the one, the one issue is that – you could do some things in the NFL. I don't think that you know, it, it's a narrow window, but you could theoretically do something in the NFL that you might not be able to do in college because college they're in, they're in school. Like they're going to have to be on campus. Like if you're not on campus, the NFL could like quarantine all their teams and like you're in this bubble. Now it's bigger than an NBA bubble, but you could theoretically do that. It's a 53 man roster versus, uh, you know, over a hundred players and all that stuff. I think it would be very difficult to pull off, but because you don't have like the the, the university aspect of it, yep. there's potential for a TV only kind of product where they're like these guys have to leave their families and they're and they would probably do it. Um, yeah, you know. So I, I just don't think you have that option in the in college, but th it seems unlikely also. But there's I think you could do things in the NFL you just couldn't do in college. Yeah, the, the, the NFL. The NFL is also king, too. So if they move their games around, TV will follow suit versus if Arizona State's playing, you know, uh, Nebraska on in week one, they may not get that game televised if they try to move it two days earlier or two days later or whatever. Yeah. I, you, you could delay, I think, the NFL season. You could move the NFL season around easier than you could college football, too. Um, yeah. yeah. You could shorten it. You could get rid of the preseason games, which they probably will. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's tougher to move college because you have all this, yeah. you know, interaction from all the you know, different conferences and everything. I think the thing we talked about before, it might just be if it's delayed, then you almost take like each conference and like, hey, you guys figure out, just play each other and then we'll get a champion at the end. And maybe you have an expanded playoff uh, wow. afterwards. So like that. But then you're changing everything, you know. So there's yeah. um, I don't know. It's uh, it's weird. Hopefully it doesn't come to that. But. We shall see. We have multiple questions about recruiting. Uh, Tito says, will there be an early signing day this season, or do you think they will just do a February signing day because recruits cannot go on official visits yet to, due to the virus? And A Dog's Life in Portland says, should slash would then say keep early signing period if, football, if the football season is canceled? I'm kind of rooting that they just get rid of it for this year, the early <laughs> signing period, because I don't like it. But... Um, <laughs> But they might, you know, they might not. And it, it might end up being what the intent was, where there'll be some guys that just sign because they know I want to go to USC or UCLA or Texas or whatever, and not everybody signing because there's so many visits that aren't going to be able to happen and stuff. So um, I, I, I don't know. But at, at best, I think it'll be, uh, they'll still be, I think there's going to be more people signing in February. 
Uh, maybe not all of them, but I think there'll be more people signing almost no matter what at this point. Yeah, I think that uh, I think I said this last week, but Gerard had pointed had said that he thought that they would just kind of eliminate the December period because of that I think that more like Ryan that you know that they they would still allow it because the very first year that they put in the early signing period, players weren't able to take those early visits. So I don't think that they're going to change um, from what they're doing. I think they would still have it. I just think you would see more players actually sign in February than you do in that earlier period uh, if things go the way they are right now. Um, someone said, uh, who was it? Oh, Leonard's like, Ryan coughing? It's like, sorry, i just been talking a lot. It was a throat thing. That's why I had a little drink. So I'm checking my temperature like four times a day. I've been pretty healthy, so lucky with that. Um, we have another Facebook one from Desi. Pay-per-view games. Um, oh. Yeah, I don't know. Again, I don't know if that – I think you could work in the NFL. I don't know if it would work in college. It could work maybe in the NBA, but I don't know. What do you guys think? The problem is that you've already signed TV contracts. So the yeah. TV comp the TV uh, organizations already have those rights. So yeah. you would have to buy those rights back and then be able to put on a pay-per-view for almost all the games. There's a couple – I mean, some schools like the SEC, I think they have their Tier 3 rights or something like that. Uh, you know, the Big 12. So there's a couple conferences that, you know, that they could do that. However, like USC does not have own the rights to those games. They've already sold those. So, you know, they would have to buy them back and then try to put on a pay-per-view event. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not necessarily the issue. It's it's the other variables of keeping players healthy, the traveling. That's more the issue than, I guess, the, the scheduling of the networks. Because at, at worst, could you play games without them being televised if you really wanted to? But that's where the money is, right? Yeah, there'd be yeah. no point in playing a game without yeah, television. Yeah. I'm just thinking of bias. I just want to cover these games' point of view, but yes. Yeah, I mean, they, they talked about, like, you could have remote cameras that were, uh, you know, just not, you know, they don't have a camera person there. It's set up remotely, and people are kind of controlling them that way. Um, I'm looking for Periscope to see if we have any questions over there. Oh, we uh, have a question from Coley White, who said, uh, of course, resident Notre Dame fan. He says, Brian Kelly was on SVP's show uh, Friday night, any chance that Helton would appear on a major broadcast, or is he keeping a low profile on purpose? He went on a CBS broadcast. Um, it was like a web one, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't as big as like something like that. I don't I don't know if he's trying to keep a low profile. They've been definitely putting more of the assistant coaches sort of uh, out front. He's um, tweeting again, which was noteworthy. He's tweeting, and uh, I I think they like their staff a lot. I don't know if Clay Helton's going to be made. You know, available a bunch. I mean, we could you know try to talk to them, get them on Tunnel Vision. We thought we'd get some some of the assistant coaches on there. They're very excited, and they're and I think the university and the athletic department sees the value in having these new assistants be out there a little bit more. So like they you know they let me talk with Osmus, and we just did a story on that. I didn't do like on a, a live thing, but we could do a live thing with come a couple of new assistants. Um, curious to see. I mean, I, I don't know if Helton's really you know, making a lot of headlines and stuff right now. I think it's sort of like a wait and see thing, but I don't, I don't think USC would say no if like SVP wanted to have him on. Yeah. I just don't think there's that much interest in him right now yeah. to have him on a national show like that. No, yeah. Makes sense. That's pretty much it for YouTube questions, boss man. Cool. Um, we have uh, Friday on my mind from Periscope. How many players are confirmed sick? So we kind of went over this beginning no, no one on the team that we know uh, has tested positive, but Shotgun mentioned Tony Baselli, former player, uh, did, and then Quentin Powell being sick. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of what we know as of now. I haven't heard of anyone on the beat that covers. Uh, if you remember Kaylee Hartung, she used to be a sideline reporter for ESPN. Uh, mm -hmm. She's now an ABC the regular news reporter, and she got it. She was covering the breakout in, in Seattle and ended up getting it. Um, so I listened to uh, Bruce and <laughs> Stu, their podcast, uh, the audible, they talked to her. So she's kind of known in the college football world. I haven't, have you heard of other college football writers or anyone? I haven't heard anyone like in the college football world that I remember at least. No. I mean, Michael Pittman's grandpa, I believe was, was right. I, did we ever hear an update on that? No, it was his Michael's, Michael Sr., like his father is the one that I think yeah. that, that put that on social media. But I haven't heard an update uh, since then. Mm -hmm. um, but. I know Doris Burke got it, DB, uh, but she's NBA, but still. Right. Oh, I, I didn't realize she got it. Wow. That's, yeah, uh, she, yeah, she got it. 
Um, you know, there was, I think there was a lot of NBA stuff because of the Rudy Gobert thing. There, you know, yeah. there's been, uh, you know, people that worked at the Staples Center and things like that, but I haven't really heard anything else from the USC side. And when I talked to Aaron Osmond, not that he would say anything, there's like the HIPAA laws, but it yeah. didn't sound like there was all this concern about, you know, that their, their guys were sick or anything like that. And he's, he told me he didn't, he wasn't pushing like, Hey, you guys got to work out and stay in shape because that'll fight off the virus. He's like, that's, we're going to like go in there. They just wanted to get, you know, get guys healthy and keep them in shape. And uh, they just wanted all the guys to be safe. So I think that's why all the precautions were taken. Yes. Cool. Makes sense. All right. I think, uh, Periscope love. Yeah. So yeah, he thanked me for the answer. All right. Well, good stuff. We did have a phone nice. call. Oh, wait. Oh, crap. We have a call. Should I take it? We might as well take it. One last call, right? I don't know who it is. So let's, uh, let's you take the call. To it, Brian. Yes. Caller, can you hear us? What's your name and where you're calling from? Hey, Ryan and Kaylee. This is the Cattleman in Tennessee. Yes, Cattleman. How are you, bud? Uh, great. And watching you guys live. Nice. Hey, oh. uh, Ryan, first off, I think your wife might have created a health crisis filming these morons over here at the Honky Tonks in Nashville. I, I think uh, they've locked Tennessee down after your wife took that video. Yeah, so uh, that was she was at the stage, and she tweeted out a video, and uh, <laughs> the mayor of Nashville shut down the bars uh, the very that day or something. So, yes, that was a, that was a crazy, crazy situation. <laughs> Yeah, just kind of making some conversation. We love your wife, uh, Ryan. No, the, you know, don't forget Bill King's show. Don't forget if, if we're all we all live to tell about it next spring. Uh, don't forget the Bill King show. Uh, sure, Ryan. yeah. If Bill, have, whenever Bill wants me on, I come on. So, yeah. Hey guys, uh, got a uh, uh, a question about Lane Kiffin. I'm a, I've called you before about this. I'm a huge Lane Kiffin fan, as you might remember. I know USC fans these days talk a lot about the pass on Orgeron. And, you know, Joe Burrow and Joe Brady off to the Carolina Panthers, blah, blah, blah. But I've always felt, and I think you disagree with me on this, Ryan. What you're saying, you don't, guys that know the fight song, something like that? Right, yeah. Like, don't, USC can't hire anyone that knows the fight song. So that, that was my yeah. theory. Yeah, uh, okay. That, okay. Well, you know, Lane Kiffin's making $4 million a year in, in Oxford, Mississippi, almost as big as L.A. last time I looked. So I, I don't think he's too worried about the Pac-12 right now. But um, I do think Lane Kiffin is a hell of a coach, Ryan. And you guys, I don't like, I mean, Clay Hilton's a nice guy. He's, he's somebody's offensive coordinator. He's somebody's offensive line coach. He's not a head football coach. And not only do you guys crap on, on Orgeron, you crapped on Kiffin, too, on that tarmac. And how big of a moron is Pat Hayden, by the way? <laughs> Pat Hayden should have fired himself on that tarmac. And whatever you think about uh, – and, and, and by the way, Ryan, I'd like to know. I'm sure you've talked with Lane around the practice field a time or a hundred. I think you probably agree with me deep down he, he is the real successor to Pete Carroll. And now now you got Clay Helton over there that nobody likes, and you got Lane Kiffin, who you guys could have had ten times or should have never fired in the first place. And I, 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 this isn't a lecture. I just, I just love USC, and I've really become a fan of the Trojans because of you guys. But I do think it does say something where nobody in town likes Clay Helton, and, and Lane Kiffin has had to go to FAU, and you guys tried to ignore him and all that crap, and the national media did too. And here comes Lane Kiffin back, and you guys are stuck with his quarterbacks coach. But I'm watching every night, and y'all stay safe and clean. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, big uh... – Big uh, Lane Kiffin fan there. Um, yeah, I think it's one of those situations where, like, say you're in uh, a relationship and maybe you're not ready for the relationship and, and, you know, it's just not the right time and you break up and, like, five years later you see the person and you're like, oh, yeah, this is uh, – it would work out much better. I think USC and Lane Kiffin would probably have worked out better uh, when he got hired at FAU, if USC never hired him to begin with, uh, I think it's going to be really hard to kind of go back to that now. You've, you've gone back to the well with Lane and then Sark, and you try to bring him back again. And you don't want to hire him after he's been at a, a SEC school for one year again. It happened again. Who knows? Maybe he has a great run at, at you know in Mississippi, and then you know later on, five years down the road, USC hires him back. I could see something like that, you know, possibly happening, but. Right now, no. I think he did a good job of rebuilding his image, 
going with Nick Saban and, and you know winning a championship and stuff there, coaching it at FAU for a while, getting some big profile games, high profile games, and then now we'll see what he can do back in the in the SEC. But um, yeah, I, I think USC was justified in firing him when they did. They should have fired him earlier than they did. But I think they would have been better off. They, the problem was hiring him when they did. You hired him after one year at Tennessee. If you waited for like three or four years at Tennessee and he was fighting with Saban for a couple of years and making a lot of noise, I think it would have been a better time. But they just hired him too early. He was kind of immature the way he handled things, and that's sort of where things ended up. What do you guys think? <laughs> well, Shockin and I were sitting in silence for that long call. All I could take from the call was the comments rolling in on YouTube and they weren't too happy about said caller. Oh, uh, yes. Um, so I can't really add any input on what they said, um, but... I believe it was Lane Kiffin returning, which I don't believe is viable at this point. Yeah, sorry. We're, we'll have to figure this out. I'm sorry that you guys can't uh, hear the calls. And plus, he was going on for quite a while. So. <laughs> it was a long time to sit in silence, yeah. Uh, I think we got one more. And uh, I'll try to I'll see if this will work. You're on the air, caller. Uh, yeah. Thanks for calling in. What's your name and where are you calling from? Denasia. Hello. Yeah, What what's your name and where you're calling from? Elijah from Florida. Elijah from Florida. Okay, that's a cool name. What, what's your question? I'm just, I'm just nine. Nothing. I'm just nine. Okay. Hello. All right. Um, well, I'm a really big fan of you guys. You're a big fan. Oh, thank you very much. Welcome. All right. Well, you have a you have a great night, and uh, thanks for calling in. You too. Okay. We just had a call, the, uh, a fan. So uh, that was nice. Um, <laughs> nice. Fun, times. Fun times on Tunnel Vision. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, I think we should probably wrap it up after that. Um, some interesting, uh, some calls there. We did, yeah. Our screener wasn't really putting any information on the uh, screen. Yeah. So we might have lost our screener, I think, at some point. But okay. I'll crack that whip. Yeah. We got to make sure what's going on. Um, but yeah, guys, thanks for uh, doing this. We'll f so, I think we fixed the. I think we did it. The audio problem, but now we have to make sure you guys can hear calls. So that's the yeah. only. So I'll, we'll we'll figure that out. Or we just get a radio host that you know can relay what has been messaged in those calls. One of those yeah. two. We'd rather yeah. I'd rather you hear the calls, but you know, <laughs> we'll figure that out. But uh, the echo is gone, which is great. Thanks for everyone for being patient with us and Facebook works and everything. So all the people on Facebook, all the people on YouTube, all the people on Periscope, we do appreciate you uh, calling in. Yes. Everyone, be safe. Stay at home if you don't have to go out anywhere. Let's do what we can to get this freaking over with and get college football back. We got to get it back. So uh, yes. but, and we do appreciate you spending some time with all of us here. We'll keep the shows going. If you have any requests for stuff during the week, uh, tweet at us, email us, whatever you want to do. Here, I'll put up our Twitters again. Oop, wrong one. I put up the I put up the blank run. I'll put up our Twitters up there on the uh, the screen so you guys can kind of check it out. But thanks so much uh, for tuning in, and uh, we'll talk Stay to you next safe, time. Everybody. Stay safe out there.